you all this morning. I am responsible for the division called Treasury Services at First Tennessee Bank. So I'm the Treasury Executive and I, underneath me I have a product team and a sales team. We are, uh, my, my team is the most profitable product set in the bank. We generate um, a lot of revenue for First Tennessee Bank and my sales team works very closely with the credit lenders um, that help your businesses too. So I'm going to talk a little bit about um, access to capital from a, from a little bit of a different slant. Uh, a little bit about my background prior to this job. Most of my career, I won't date myself, but I've been in banking forever. Uh, joined First Tennessee about eight years ago out in North Carolina where about ten years ago we started out uh, a commercial and um, um, commercial real estate and private client effort out there and it is booming now. We, we have just announced we have bought our first bank out there in Raleigh, North Carolina and so that is one of our targeted growth markets. We have offices now in addition to Tennessee in Charleston, South Carolina Carolina, in Jacksonville, Florida, in Winston-Salem, North Carolina, Charlotte, North Carolina, Raleigh, North Carolina, and Richmond, Virginia. So we are expanding wildly. Um, as I said, my team is responsible. How many know, how many people know what treasury services or treasury management is? Or cash management? Oh. They're Skyping someone. <laughs> okay. All righty. How many know what cash management is? How many practice good cash management? Okay, I hope everybody raises their hand. Okay, let me, let me talk a little bit about cash management. And again, this is access to capital, but I'm going to talk about it in terms of your, your company's capital because you couple that with the capital that banks and other providers lend or um, invest in you. So the first thing I will say where that's concerned is what my team is responsible for is calling on companies and making sure that their cash flow is sustainable, is managed appropriately, and can repay any debt that the bank gives to you. So we focus very strongly on your management of your customers' accounts receivables, how you process, process that, how you get it in the bank, your payables and your relationship with your vendors, and then calculating your cash position in between and understanding whether or not you have enough to invest on a daily basis or borrow. And that's where the lenders then come in to help you figure out what your borrowing needs might be. Okay, so cash flow means, and the reason why that's critical is that's what pays back the loan. That's what pays back any debt. And so if you don't have a handle on that, the banker's going to be very reluctant to lend you money. And so, again, that's what we focus on. So let me, I, I wanted to provide just a few little tips, some things that my team covers with their clients to make sure that they're practicing good cash management. And the first is know your customer. And so you need to know who you're doing business with because in effect with accounts receivables you're pretty much lending your customer money. So if you're lending your customer money, you want to make sure that you understand who's running that business, do they have the ability to repay you, and make sure that you, repay, that you get repaid timely. When you get repaid timely, you need to get it in the bank as quickly as possible. So how many here use remote deposit capture? as the way to get your money in the bank. How many know what remote deposit capture is? Okay, so that's a product that we were one of the first banks in the country to bring to the commercial market back before Check 21 and Image Cash or, or Image Checks even became law. So we were a leader in that product and it's because you can get your money into the bank quicker without having to go to a branch. 
and you can extend your deposit deadline up until 7.30 in the evening to get same day ledger credit. So that's your faster access to capital. You get your money quicker, you can use your money more quickly. So that's the first thing. Diversify your customer base. Are, you, are your customers, do you have customer concentration? If you do, you need, what, what would happen if that customer walked away from you? So if they're over 50% of your revenue stream or even creeping up on 50%, you should have a plan to diversify your customer base. So that's, those are some of the tips on the customer and receivable side. Next is payables. So you want to control your outflow of cash. You don't want to pay before you have to pay, right? And so you should have good terms with your vendors. You should pay them timely because then that affects your credit. You should not have vendor concentration. So again, just like on the receivable side, if you're relying on a supplier very heavily and that supplier goes away, what kind of disruption would that bring to your business and your cash flow? There are also products that banks sell that can help you extend your payables cash flow and also generate cash for your business, hard cash for your business. One of which is credit cards, commercial credit cards. So you should be asking your banker about credit card or corporate commercial credit card products that help you extend your payables. Some of those products even give you cash rebates or points that you can redeem. The cash rebates, if you spend X amount every month with your vendor or on an annual basis with your vendors, you can get actual cash back, a check from the bank that goes into your account and into your cash flow system. So it's the only place where accounts payable generates revenue. So that's one tip. Um, the other thing with your with your um, cash is once you know your inflows and your outflows is you should be calculating your cash position every day. That means reconciling your checking accounts and also getting the information off of how many use online banking for your businesses. Okay? Everyone should be using online banking. You ought to go on every day and look at all of the transactions hitting your account, every attraction com uh, a transaction coming in, going out, and then figuring out what your daily cash position is so that you know whether or not you need to borrow that day or invest. So again, knowing your cash position is critical. You ought to be doing trend analysis. So the, inf the payment information, the payments that you're receiving and making are nothing without the information about those payments. And that's what online banking information can give for you. And so you ought to be looking at taking that information, down in it, downloading it into a spreadsheet, and doing trend analysis, seeing month over month what your cash flow fluctuations are. And then even year over year, because that's what a banker is going to want to know from you is do you have a handle on not only what your cash flow is going in and out, but what kind of trends are you seeing with your businesses? And do you understand what those fluctuations in cash mean and what's driving those? So again, um, uh, just being cognizant of the information that goes in and out of your of, of your accounts. Um, the other thing I would say is, do you know, do, do, when you meet with your banker, do you understand your financial statements? And to do that, you really need to make sure you're surrounding yourself with the right kind of partner team, and really kind of internally and externally. So. A lot of entrepreneurs are great at what they know they can do, their expertise. They may or may not be great at running their businesses. And so make sure you have people within your company that are financially savvy. But that does not excuse you from understanding the fluctuation in your numbers. When we go meet with a client, we're going to be looking at their financial statements and saying, why did your receivables go up? Why did your payables go down? What's driving that? So numbers are nothing but the meaning behind the numbers. And so you should be understanding what's going on with your customers, what's going on with your vendors, so that you can explain those fluctuations. Because that's going to drive your borrowing need. Um, are you overexposed? 
No one should be overexposed in credit, um, either personally or for your business. And so making sure that you're not borrowing too much that you can't then pay back. And that's another thing that we will help you assess. Your banker ought to be mutually educating you as well. And so when they come to talk with you, you're the expert about your business, but you also should be relying on your banking partner to educate you on products and services that are best for your company. They also ought to know something about your industry as well. So if they come in not understanding anything about your industry, that's a red flag. So again, it ought to be a mutual relationship where you're educating each other. Some of your other partners that we like to see and, and we like to make sure you're surrounding yourself with, and I think I heard it in the last session, are CPAs, attorneys, even professional business coaches that, can, that have run businesses before and can help you make sure you're running your business appropriately as well. Multiple bank relationships. So most small businesses really only need one bank. But don't single source your bank either. And when I say don't single source, it doesn't mean you should be banking with multiple partners. It just means you should be getting out there meeting other bankers and, and, and let, it, let them call on you. If they, if they want to call on you, let them call on you. They can educate you about things. And it also helps you make sure that you can ask them the right questions of your prime banking partner. And it also gives you a source just in case you need it. Um, what we like to see is if we, the more we know our borrower, the more, the more comfortable we can get. And so if I'm calling on a prospect and getting to know that business, a lot of times if something goes wrong with that other bank, I'm the first person that they call. And that's, that's, what, that's what we like. Um, I'll talk a little bit about sources of capital and the stages of that just real quickly and then I'll end. Um, Self-funding is the very first one. So if you're going to start a business, a lot of folks will start it with their own funds. My advice there is don't quit your day job until you know it's going to work. Uh, friendly capital, family, that patient capital, family, friends that are willing to invest in your business. They should be ready, however, if you need more financing from a bank to subordinate that debt to the bank, which means they don't get repaid until the bank gets repaid or another borrower gets repaid. Of course, there's always angel investors, folks that really invest in businesses to get them started. I mentioned credit cards. That is a source of funding for you. And equity lines of credit, another source of funding for you. More traditional financing, which I know you'll hear more about at the conference, are community development corporations or CDFIs, community development financial institutions, state and local funds, and of course the SBA that can provide more support to credits, um, to more traditional credits. And then for bank loans, for small business loans, just be prepared to understand what the expectations are of the bank and they look at cash flow first. Then they're going to look at what a secondary source of repayment is, which could be your assets, your fixed assets in your business, which we prefer over softer ones like receivables and um, inventory. And then also cash, CDs, that's another source. But there's also uh, under Reg B some less strict criteria that bank can use for minority and female-owned businesses. And, um, and there are those programs available where banks will develop less strict credit policies so that it can meet the needs of businesses that um, can't meet traditional uh, loan policy. So with that, I'll stop and turn it over to my next partner here. Thank you. Um, my name is Carmen West. I'm with the U.S. Department of Commerce, MBDA. Um, that's the Minority Business Development Agency. We are the only federal agency that's designed to help minority-owned firms become globally competitive. 
Um, we were enacted in 1969 by President Nixon. Um, we are one of 13 agencies in the Department of Commerce. Um, to give you a little bit about what we do, um, I run our Access to Capital team, and our Access to Capital team is an elite squad. We're deal brokers. We help minority-owned firms gain access to capital um, by way of accounting, um, tax, due diligence, debt, equity, accounting, any type of capital deal we do. Anything from um, traditional financing, which is your banks, alternative financing, which is your marketplace lending, um, accounts receivable financing, to growth capital, which would include angel investment, venture backing, um, mezzanine financing, family offices, et cetera. Um, there are quite a few of resources for access to capital for minority-owned firms. So because we know that access to capital is the number one impediment, what I'd like to do is save some time for you to ask questions so that we can help you gain that access. Um, we have 44 business centers around the country. We have one here in Memphis that's um, being ran by the Minority Business Council. Um, as far as our metrics and what we've done as an agency and a small agency um, is we've done six business billion dollars in contracts and financing for minority-owned firms. Two billion of that was capital. So we realize that there is a space and a need for us. Um, so what we'd like to do is engage you and to find out how we can provide that access. Hello, my name is Dorian Spears, and I bring you greetings on behalf of the Economic Development Growth Engine, or EDGE. Um, I am an economic development specialist, and I have a few hats that I wear, one of which are loans, and we administer the SBA 504, and EDGE has its own loan fund. Also, small business technical assistance. So regardless of where you are in your business stage, you can come to me. We sit down, schedule meetings, and talk about the best ways to connect you either, either to capital or contacts that you need to know so that you can build your business. Um, so that's what I'll leave it in a nutshell just to do the introduction and definitely want to leave time for questions and an engagement with you all. Good morning. My name is Keith Dillyhunt and I am the Vice President of Sales and Marketing for Enoble Business Capital. And Enoble Business Capital is an accounts receivable factoring firm. So essentially what we will do is that we will advance up to 90% of your accounts receivable forward to you. So in the event that you have sold your product or your services uh, to a client and they are taking up to 60, sometimes 90 days to get you repaid, we have the ability to advance those receivables to you with within a time frame of 60 minutes. We are located right now at 813 Ridge Lake Boulevard. We're moving into our new facilities in June. Uh, you can see it just off the expressway, but we have been around for over 20 years and we are now in 38 states. Uh, my background is in commercial lending. I uh, used to manage First Tennessee Small Business Lending for a number of years. so. Um, my focus within a noble is to assist us into growing into other industries. Uh, our background has been in the transportation in industry for the, over the 20 years, but we are now looking to uh, assist more entrepreneurs with some of their factoring. And the biggest problem right now for any business is access to capital. You may have sold that product, but now you're sitting around waiting to get paid and you can't go out and fulfill other jobs because that client is now holding you hostage with that money. We can help with that. So what I'll do at this point is uh, I'd like to kind of throw it out there. Sorry, Thank we have another speaker out there on Skype. Okay, you're on. All right, hello everyone. My name is Elgin Tucker, and I am the founder, co-founder, and current CEO of CommuniFunder. We're the first crowdfunding and business development platform that is targeted toward minority entrepreneurs. So essentially what we do is we help those entrepreneurs who have issues developing their businesses, uh, developing their financial statements, their legal paperwork, uh, access to market, all of those different types of documents and strategies that entrepreneurs need to have an understanding of, we help them to develop 
each and every one of those using our online platform. We also have a crowdfunding tool that we use to assist entrepreneurs with their uh, access to with the access to capital, the point at which we're talking about today. Uh, we developed this platform two years ago while I was a student at uh, Yale University. We were accepted to Yale University's uh, incubator where we were allowed to develop it with a host of mentors. They provide us with some seed capital and whatnot. Uh, but the beautiful thing about this platform is that it's a group of Morehouse men who developed it. And we saw a need within our community for where entrepreneurs have a difficulty accessing capital, securing that money, and making using it uh, to, to gain access to their customers and to build their businesses. So we're here to answer any questions that you all may have about the growing technology, the new field that we're all embarking on, and how things are changing in this field that will allow not just accredited investors, but also people, everyday people like myself, uh, interact with businesses and actually invest in these companies to help them uh, bolster their enterprise. So I'd like to pass it on so we can, you know, ha have for the questions section. Can we get an email out information at this um, website? They would like your email and um, website information? Sure. So the website is gocommunifunder.com. That's G O C O M M U N I funder.com. And we can be reached at the, the team at communifunder.co. What are the questions? What, yes. What actually makes you uh, different from Indiegogo or Kickstarter? So, with Kickstarter, generally you have to have an artistic project or something that is more focused on the arts or specifically technology, something in that realm. We open ourselves up to all types of businesses. So you can have a mom and pop shop, a bakery, a barber shop, or you can have a new app that you've just developed. So that's one way in which we separate ourselves. We also have developed a community of entrepreneurs as well as investors and innovators who are interested in supporting minority enterprises. Generally, when you go to a Kickstarter or Indiegogo, you may find yourself on the 30th or 25th page that they have. Um, for us, you'll be on the front page. With us, we work with you directly to help develop your crowdfunding campaign at no extra cost. Uh, we, again, are most interested in helping to develop minority entrepreneurs, so we put all of our effort into working with those that we bring onto our platform so that they can achieve the greatest level of success. Uh, this type of service is unprecedented in the marketplace, as you can see by those uh, providers that currently uh, exist like those Indiegogos and uh, Kickstarters. We also re uh, require a much lower burden in terms of the the percentage that we take from your campaign. Indiegogo, Kickstarter, they take around 7 to 8%, whereas we take 5%. So there are a few things that we do that separate ourselves, but I think what, what's most interesting about us is our dedication to minority entrepreneurs and developing our community through our crowdfunding platform, something that's just not seen on other tools. Okay, and uh, Indiegogo does do the 4% when you actually reach your goal and 9% when you don't. I heard you mention 5%. Uh, me personally, right. I do technology. So in your case, do you have 5% whether you reach your goal or whether you do not reach your goal? Is that different? Yes, it's, it's for us it's a 5% flat rate. And one of the things Indiegogo doesn't let you know about is some of the, uh, is, are the transaction fees that are also associated with that. Uh, I'm not, they have a third party transaction client that handles all of their, uh, the money that changes from, uh, for, from those who are giving to campaigns and that's transferring over to the, the crowdfunding campaign developer. Uh, so while it says 4%, it's generally gonna come out somewhere around 7%. Again, ours is going to be 5% regardless of whether you've met your goal or you don't meet your goal. And that's also something that's unique about our platform is that you don't have to meet your goal in order to get all of the finances that you've applied for. So if you have a campaign for $10,000 and you reach the $8,000 mark, you're still going to be able to walk away with that money uh, and we'll only take the 5% as I said. Oh. No question? Great. Do we have any other questions? How do you get accepted? You said get on the platform. What do you mean by that? The question is, how do you um, get on your platform? Is it? 
That's a great question. So generally, there's, a, there's an application phase. There's an application that we have on, to, on the platform where entrepreneurs can go onto our website, uh, click the sign in button, or, or you know, and begin to create their project. Uh, what our team then does is we, act, uh, we review the project and make a determination based off of what we've seen in front of us, whether or not this particular project is ready to go live. There are different variables that we assess to determine whether or not a project is ready to go live, and many of that is just based on how much you're asking for, how large your enterprise is, uh, who your customer base is, and generally, if you if we can come to the conclusion that you have a very good op good chance of actually meeting your raise. One of the things we would hate for our entrepreneurs to do is to go on the platform, put their enterprise out there to the world, and not reach their goal. So in order to do that, we um, do our best to make sure that these companies are, are strong. If you And if you're not at that point in which we think you should move forward, then we push you through to the business development side of things where we help you reach that level where you can then go live on the platform and begin to raise the money. So uh, we're a full service platform in that respect. And it's not a very high hurdle. It's just we our, our, what we're doing is trying to determine which side of the platform you should be on. Thank you. I have a question now for Carmen. Um, in terms of uh, your part of Commerce Department, do you have a local partner? Edge mentioned working with SBA. How do, how do organizations in Memphis take advantage of what your elite team is doing uh, based out of Washington? Sure. So um, SBA is our sister company um, or agency, if you will. SBA actually was um, delegated lending authority. So they get dollars to actually lend out. We do not. Um, as I mentioned that we're deal brokers, what differentiates us versus an SBDC is we actually take a business, we analyze their financials, and we help them determine what type of capital is necessary to close a transaction or to create growth. For example, if you are a construction construction company and you have this $40 million contract and you need bonding, but we've uh, reviewed your financials and you're not cash flowing. So we're going to tell you that it may not be feasible for you to embark on this contract at this time if you don't have the necessary capital needs. And at the same time, our business development centers will work on whatever the impediments are to get you ready. Um, as far as what how our centers take uh, advantage of us, with 44 business centers around the country, um, we are headquartered in DC. Um, every center have access to not only the access to capital team, those of us with over 20 years experience in the capital arena, they also have access to our access to contracts team. Those teams actually, that team actually help them access large contracts for their constituents in their area. In addition to that, we have an access to markets team, which focuses um, specifically on exports. So every center have the ability to engage us um, and we engage them as well. Um, we help educate them through webinars and trainings. Um, we also have a national training conference that we have annually for our business centers, but any of my centers can contact us. Um, lastly, we've had um, our first annual um, Minority Finance Forum. We partnered with the Association for Corporate Growth. Um, that one event in October landed us $1.5 billion in transactions for minority-owned firms. So we are very, very different than our sister agency. Um, as indicated, we did $2 billion in capital with 44 business centers. Um, the SBDC, which again is our sister agency, has over 900 SBDCs, and I believe they did a little under a billion. So I think it's just basically how we engage our clients, um, the, the process, and um, our, our goal is to really help them grow and become competitive. So, did you have your question? Sure. I just wanted to talk a little bit about um, the resources that are available to you, and then I wanted to turn it over to my colleague here from EDGE so she can talk about the different resources that are available. Um, <clears throat> again, I shared that access to capital is the number one impediment for all businesses. Um, we have 5.9 million MBE firms throughout the country, and right now there's 9 million non-minority firms that are still looking for capital. So what that says to us is that uh, the impediment crosses our ethnicity. Um, <clears throat> So I wanted to make you aware of funds that are available in your area that you may be able to uh, take advantage of them. I'm sure that all of us know about the SBA um, loan programs. 
and in understanding that SBA has a 2% lending rate um, to minorities, to African Americans, 4% to Hispanics, and 20% to Asians, what we've identified is that um, there's no one helping the MBEs with the actual issues as to why they can't qualify for their loans. And we realized since the recession that small businesses are still soft. Um, they don't have credit worthiness. Um, they've lacked the um, uh, historical business experience just because of the marketplace. So our business centers develop, and that's why we're MBDA, development agencies. So I encourage you to engage with our high-level staff to help you address the impediments. Um, one of the other um, funds that was actually um, provided by President Obama uh, back in 2012 was the Small Business Credit Initiative funds. Over $1.5 billion was released to states to help businesses grow, not specifically for minority-owned firms, but specifically for small business. And Tennessee was awarded $29.7 million. So I need for you individuals um, who are looking for financial backing to talk to your state to find out what they said they were going to use those funds for. Now, I do know they initially apply for those funds to use as venture capital. Um, however, there may be dollars left over, and they have the ability to change um, how they can use the rest of those funds. Um, secondly, the Department of Transportation, for those of you that are in uh, construction, they actually have a financing program for construction contracts where they do basic basically a factoring mechanism. So if you have a construction contract, um, they partner with local community banks so that you can access those funds as well. And I would say to dovetail on some of Carmen's points is a couple of things. Another program that we offer is called the Inner City Economic Development Fund, and it's um, a forgivable loan program, for the lack of a better word. And it actually is a subset and a line item for pilots. So for some of the controversial things that come up with EDGE as it relates to granting those, for instance, IKEA getting approved, there's a line item for any pilot that's approved that specifically donates money back to inner city economic development. So there, we specifically worked with that pilot program or this the phase one of the program in Binghamton and South Memphis. And now, giving, let's say, late May, early June, we're going to have a phase two launch that's citywide. So any businesses that need some sort of facade improvement, some type of streetscape improvement, some interior improvements, we do a two to one match, which means for every dollar you put in, we put in two, up to 25,000 as it stands right now. That will allow you to be able to make those improvements to invite more customers into your space. Um, and it's a commercial. It was, it did start out initially as a retail project. We've actually ex expanded that uh, beyond that, that realm. And just back to some of the limitations that some of the people that come in to see me or meet, creditworthiness is an issue. I'm the type of person, for anyone that does know me, very candid conversations about what money you have to bring to the table, any particular money, many issues you may deal with. It's about making sure you handle those first before you even go before someone that could potentially fund you. That's been uh, an interesting and sore spot for some, but if you're willing to come and let us know where you are, then we can be realistic about where we can help take you. So those are just a couple of other things that I can lend on the edge side. But back to the small business technical assistance, anywhere you are, um, being able to meet with we, me, we can talk about it, and then figure out what business service providers would be worth your time and energy and effort and investment. Um, and I also want to do a, a quick shout out for the CDFIs. Um, those are partnerships that I've had a chance to develop in the last four months. There is a network here of about seven institutions, uh, some of which are some of the vendors today. Yeah, they're right outside. Um, and just being able to meet with them, they formalized the network this year. They're going to have a lunch and learn session in April. Oh, well, actually in May. Take that back because April's almost over. But they're going to have a lunch and learn session next month. So if they can't really get money through traditional funding sources, they are also an incredible asset. And not only do they do the lending side, but they actually do sit with you, help you understand your financials and your numbers, and give you a realistic perspective as to how you can grow your business um, so that it's sustainable, not just a one shot in the dark, but you can have and it can last for, for longer than, than possible. Um, I'd like to have Keith talk a little bit about um, alternative financing. Sometimes um, being a small, I was a small business owner myself, um, started my business in my college dorm with my husband, um, generated $4 million in revenue, um, had 60 employees and failed. 
Um, I failed because I lacked a business acumen to run a business. Um, we thought it was more within our realm to buy Bentleys and to buy shoes and to live in a million dollar home other than watch um, really our finances and try to become um, what I like to say is attractive to debt versus chasing it. What I'd like Keith to talk about is talk about an, an, an alternative form of capital um, that may help you in the, in the short term um, that can help you expand and grow and then we can come back to Lynn and talk about the traditional lending um, opportunities that you may have as well to offset that. Thank you. Um, one of the ways that we can do that is through factoring. Um, but before we get to that point, let me kind of break down the different sub subsets. You have traditional banking where you have your commercial lenders that will come out and they're looking at the traditional five C's of credit that go into every deal. Uh, and then you have an opportunity to step down that scale a little bit and move into some of the SBA type deals where they will still look at the five C's of credit, but they're a little bit more lenient. And I uh, want to make sure we give some kudos to Dorian's group within EDGE because they have the ability to do the SBA 7A and the 504 loan program. And that inner city economic development program is a real thing. So you need to look into that. Uh, that's $50,000 you can just have. Now, the next thing that you can look into is what my organization does, is the factoring side of it. Whereas we don't look at the five C's of credit, we're looking at a couple of different things. We're looking at the contract or the service that you sold already. We're looking at the credit worthiness of your customer, not you. So that makes a tremendous difference. So if you have already provided that service, you have already sold what you're supposed to sell to them, and now you are simply waiting to get your money, that's where we can help. We can advance up to, like I said, 90% of that receivable to you immediately. And one of the things that you, you have to take into consideration is that we're an organization that believes in working with our clients. We understand that this is not a long-term solution. We don't want you to be in factoring all the time. We want you to get back up that scale to a commercial lender. So our rates are very reasonable, and we will work with you on that. So I have a couple of my salespeople here today. Uh, we can talk to you afterwards if you'd like to. And I will say that all of these folks have given you some great advice. Um, when I, I started a community de development lending group in Charlotte, North Carolina, and worked with a lot of these same agencies, and it was specifically for minority female-owned businesses. And so I, I understand the issues that you all face, and I'm glad you said that you don't want them to um, not try to seek traditional financing, and because a bank is a good partner for you, is, is one of your best partners and so what do we look for when we lend money you know one of the very first things we, we're going to assess is management capability because it, if, if management is not strong the company will not be strong so that gets back to my comments about make sure number one you understand your financial statements if you don't sit down with a bank sit down with these partners here and make sure that you do understand them and community colleges provide a lot of good educational sources and some of their non-degree programs uh, for professional development that also are a good education um, resource for you. So understand your financials, surround yourself with a good team, make sure you've got a good CPA either on your team or working with your biz and or working with your business um, and, and also an attorney. So management is key. When we come and meet with you, we want to we're going to ask you questions about your customers, about your vendors, about your trends, about um, your business, about your marketing efforts, and make sure you can answer those questions. Um, the next thing we're going to look at, um, your business. Again, hopefully you understand your business and your competitors. Do you understand what your competitors are doing and you, how you stack up relative to your competitors? 
And again, understanding your customers and your vendors. Then we're going to look at your industry. So management, the business, the industry, and again, how you stack up to your industry. Can you grow within that industry? Can you grow in, within the territory that you're in? And so understanding your industry dynamics is key. Then comes your financials. So you see your financials aren't the very first thing we're going to look at. It's going to be manis, management, industry, business, and then we'll look into the financials because all the rest of that, all, every single decision that you make impacts your financial statements. And so that's why we want to understand those first three first. And again, cash flow is going to be important. When we look at cash flow, typically for smaller minority-owned businesses, you're going to want to make sure that your cash flow can cover your debt service on a at least 1.25 level or at minimum one one to one with some support like SBA support and some collateral support. And again, you know, we're going to likely ask for a personal guarantee where some of the non-traditional programs will not ask for that. So that means you need to be prepared, you and your partner, to personally guarantee the debt and understand really what that means. So that'll be a, what we call a, a third source of repayment. We're going to want your cash flow to cover the debt first. Then we want to see, okay, if that can't happen, can the collateral cover the remaining debt? If we liquidated the collateral, and collateral could be um, liquidation of accounts receivable, inventory, or fixed assets. And then third is your personal guarantee. If none of those two work, can you personally repay the debt? And so we will be looking at personal credit and how you've handled that. We're happy to sit with you and teach you how to clean up your credit if it needs cleaned up and what, we, what you can do there. Um, speaking of which, you don't have to pay anyone to clean it up. There, I mean, it's really some easy, easy things for you to understand about your credit report to know whether and, and, and take action on it versus paying someone to do that for you. And so those are the main things we're going to consider when we're lending money. And, and I want to talk again about your relationship with your banker. Your banker ought to be willing to sit down with you and educate you on what it takes to get bank debt and working with, you, working with you on that. And so you should be meeting with them on a quarterly basis. Be proactive about that. Make sure that you're calling them saying, I want to sit down and review my financial statements and my business with you. And if you're meeting and talking with them on a regular basis, if you do what you say, honor, honor your word, you're supposed to get your financial statements to them quarterly, make sure you do that. If you're supposed to pay your debt on a certain day, make sure you do that. Because your behavior will drive what happens if things aren't working well. And if you've been working with them closely and things take a turn for the worse um, or go down for a period of time, they'll be much more willing to work with you through that tough time. So that's really the judge of character is how you handle your obligations and what you promise to do and, and your banker's advice. If you're following your banker's advice during the tough time, they will likely stick with you. Very well. Elgin, we'd like to have your dialogue here in understanding the disruption of the lending market. Have all of us heard of that? So that opened the doors for additional sources of capital um, and understanding that our banking market is shrinking. Um, we have uh, less than 7,000 community banks throughout the country and understanding that um, debt capital, traditional lending from a bank, is the number one uh, source of capital for minority firms. Can you share with us how the disruption of the lending market uh, can be an alternative for minority owned firms using platforms similar to yours? Sure. So, generally, as I was mentioning earlier, accredited investors have been the only ones that have been able to interact with online platforms like what we have available uh, for the interest in an equity uh, investment in companies that are looking to raise capital. Uh, now, however, unaccredited investors that are those who have less than $200,000 uh, on an annual basis and less than a certain threshold and in terms of uh, equ uh, 
in terms of the amount of money that they just generally have access to, uh, can, in, can engage in these types of investments. So what I'm saying is here, everyday people have an opportunity to engage in these types of investments, which opens the pool for investing to a much larger audience of individuals. Traditionally, again, folks have come to banks for those loans, and uh, now there's opportunities for equity investments that may not come with the same, same types of attachments or the same types of uh, rates. Uh, and the, one of the issues with that is that the criteria that's being used, I mean, you guys outlaid the type of criteria that's very uh, objective. Uh, and with crowdfunding platforms, both equity and non-equity, it can be very subjective, which can make it much more difficult for you to get the, 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 the traction that you're looking to gain and much more difficult for you to prepare when you're putting together your application. So you know, while crowdfunding is a very attractive tool, again, those traditional lending sources are a very good option for all of the reasons that you all have mentioned. On the flip side of that, because the criteria is quite subjective, it can also be a little bit easier for those who have, uh, who've gained the audience that they're looking to gain and who have captured their customer base and who can clearly state that they are generating some finances and are, are growing in a very positive direction. Uh, you know, there, there's some great things happening in this field. Uh, you know, we, we decided to, to remove ourselves from the East Coast and now we're on the West Coast trying to take advantage of some of these things that are happening here in Silicon Valley so that we can be closer to some of those companies that are looking to raise capital, uh, specifically minority entrepreneurs. And, you know, we're, we've, we're opening ourselves to all companies all across the country. We'll be slowly but surely moving into that equity space now that uh, unaccredited investors are allowed to interact and, and, and engage in these types of investments. And we look forward to interacting with some of the folks who are in this audience as well as others who may be tuning in to this, uh, to this feed. Thank you. I um, wanted to piggyback on what Elgin said is that, um, and Lynn touched on it earlier, there are going to be some credit score driven mechanisms that you're going to be required to meet so that you can qualify for some of the lending options. Um, what makes the marketplace lending uh, attractive is that um, some of them are not credit score driven. Um, again, being a small business owner who failed and who lost their business, I wish we would have had the marketplace lending available when I had my business. Um, some years ago, but I wanted you to take note of some of these alternatives in the event that you're not able to qualify right now for traditional lending. Um, one of those organizations who we just uh, created a partnership with is called Funding Circle. Uh, Funding Circle, Circle is an online lending platform a little different than what Elgin does, and I also want you to consider Elgin's platform as well. I think that uh, crowdfunding is a great asset, um, considering that the SEC just allowed uh, the platform um, to those mechanisms to be utilized, they are a great source. Um, but there are some other sources um, that may be available to you, and there's no rule that says you can't use both. So, uh, uh, so uh, Funding Circle um, is an organization that uses uh, institutional lending uh, that can um, bar will lend up to from twenty five thousand to a half a million. Um, again, the interest rates are going to be higher than your traditional banks. It's because the risk will be higher. Um, there's another uh, organization called Credit Junction. Credit Junction is the only online lending platform that uses an asset based loan um, program. Um, again, it's all done online. Um, sometimes we seem to think that just because it's online that you don't see anybody. Not the case. Um, you actually uh, submit your application online basically to decrease the, the amount of paperwork, but you actually do engage with a real person at some point. Um, the other two organizations, um, one is a merchant financier. Um, the other is a is another um, alternative lending um, source, and it's Lending Club, which is the oldest online lender, and Cabbage is spelled with a K. So um, those are just four uh, alternative lenders for those of you that are looking for capital where it is not credit score driven. But just because it's not credit score driven doesn't mean that you don't have to be capable. Um, Lynn talked about how they review their loan packages and how they look at management. Um, I had to go back to school and get, uh, get another undergrad and, and an MBA to understand what I should have been doing to run my business. Sometimes we're not the best people to run our businesses, and we just have 
have to recognize that. Um, but these lending flat platforms are going to review that. Secondly, cash flow is key. Um, and that's where our agency comes in. If you're not cash flowing, whether it's you don't understand pricing or whether you know, you're know you taking upon all this debt and what you really needed was sales, if those are your issues and engage in one of our 44 national business centers, again, we have one here in Memphis, but you're not relegated to that center. You can go to any center throughout the country. Our website is www.mbda.gov. Um, if you specialize in a specific area, whether it's advanced manufacturing, um, we have some uh, capital providers that are actually looking for more capital to raise. Um, if you have a product or idea and you need venture backing um, or looking for angel funds, or you're actually looking to be acquired or acquire another company, please consider us for those transactions. I have a question. Sure. Josh, if you could get in the mic so we'll be able to hear you. Uh, I actually want to know, uh, according to the users that are on your platform, what are some of the most funded uh, that they have received and as well as how, how wide or how broad is your market of people that you reach out to as far as investors or people that like to contribute? So you, uh, the second half of your question, I couldn't really hear how broad is what? How broad is the market that your, um, your, your platform reaches out to? Right. Our market is pretty large. Uh, we have a few thousand people. Again, we're a growing startup, uh, and we're continuing to grow, continuing to access more folks. Uh, the projects that have raised the most have been in the ten to fifteen thousand dollar range, and we've begun at the. We've begun with the types of projects that are looking that have a, a lower threshold for raising because we are a rewards-based uh, platform currently, which means that in exchange for the investments or rather the gives that folks may uh, provide to your particular company, you would provide them with some sort of gift or reward, uh, depending on whatever denomination of the give the give was. So. Uh, in short, uh, we have a very growing a, a community that we've established that's continuing to grow, and the raises that we're seeing that we can accomplish on our platform are growing day by day. So, uh, you know, I would encourage you to take a look at the platform and see if it's something that you're interested in, and you know, we can move from there. Great. So I'm hopeful that everyone here who is a small business owner who have said that they cannot find access to capital that we've cared that for you or at least expanded um, or piqued your interest um, to identify additional um, um, alternative sources of capital. Um, I'll leave it up to my colleagues here to see if they have any last commenting words. We welcome you to come and ask questions uh, at the end of the session. Thank you for attending. I think the one last bit of, bit of advice I would get is to, um, if you're really understanding your financial statements, make sure you understand what your financing needs are. Too little debt, if you're borrowing small, uh, multiple small loans, um, or not borrowing enough, or over borrowing could be detrimental to your business. So again, I think working with someone to really understand what's driving the borrowing need and how much you really need to borrow and can you pay that amount back is key. I would share to develop the relationships before you know you need the money. Um, being able to develop whether it's a partnership or when you're going out to network, just making sure that they know who you are, what you're about. Um, character piece is really critical. And then being able to just, they know to count on you when it's time to, to get your numbers together and let them know what you need. Thank you. One last piece of advice I would add is make sure you understand what your costs are. Mm -hmm. If you don't know your cost, you're lost. Mm -hmm. Understand your cash flow and how it works. How do you get repaid? How does that impact your overall numbers? Once you understand that, that's 70% of the battle. Mm -hmm. Elgin, did you have some last remarks? Sure, one of the things that we've learned as a startup ourselves is that being lean is probably one of the best things that we've been able to do. It's allowed us to be flexible, it's allowed us to assess our marketplace and how we're growing and to determine what those things are that we need. So as the first panelist said, understanding exactly what we need to raise money for, exactly how we want to deploy that capital is extremely important because we don't want to ask for too much or too little. And that's something that really uh, adheres to any entrepreneur to regardless of what type of business that they're in. Good. Very much. 
Thank you all for attending. Thank you.